when you look at this ancient mythology, you have there's a lot of things that can be told about about a culture or a society based upon their writings and their and their mythology. We have we have some record of how the monotheistic ideas were used to justify the destruction of Native American religions, cultures, ideas, fashions, spirituality, as the Spanish uh, conquest of Central Mexico, Teotihuacan, Central South America, um, as frontiersmen plowed over uh, the Apaches and the Navajo and the Arapaho. By the time that practice had become fully ensconced in the mentality of individuals who were wrapped up in uh, monotheism, it was old hat. It was easy to do. It was something that they were familiar with making happen. How do you take, uh, how do we conquer this land? How do we make this our own? How do we uh, get rid of this old stuff, make them all good little Christians so they'll bend a knee, turn a cheek, and we can do what we want? One of the first place, if you use that same mindset, and you simply reverse engineer it <laughs> and take a look at our lore, you come across a similar pattern. We see that similar pattern of physical activity uh, best exemplified by Charlemagne as he attempted to expand the church uh, when he beheaded 4,500 Saxon nobles and their families after they converted to Christianity so people would begin the conversion. Same thing can be said for the final crusades given up uh, that are performed by the Roman Catholic Church as they led the crusades against uh, Lithuania and uh, Pomerania and the, uh, and, the, and the Baltic states that were the last pagan kingdoms in the 1300s. Um, they used it. That spirituality, that monotheism became a very much a weapon. If we look at uh, what Julius Evola says in the Mystery of the Grail, and this has become kind of an important key cornerstone of what I'm working on now. He says that the, uh, the search for alternative methods of thought goes hand in hand with the growing skepticism against purely scientific rationalism. Much of what we have used in Austria today has been a purely scientific rationalism. There's not much room for that for purely scientific rationalism in faith. Never has been, probably never will be. He writes that the order of things that I deal with is that in which all materials having a historical and scientific value are the ones that matter the least. Conversely, all the mythical, legendary, and epic elements denied historical truth and demonstrative value acquire here a superior validity and become the source for a more real and certain knowledge. From the perspective of science, what matters in a myth is whatever historical elements may be extracted from it. From the perspective that I adopt, what matters in history are all the mythological elements it has to offer. Much of what we have used to make also true has been that scientific value. We have decided to deviate from the norm with regards to our spirituality, with regards to society, we have certainly adopted a very much a fringe element of society as the mainstay, main course of our life. This creates a certain difficulty. We have certain mindsets and attitudes that we have to adopt, but we also feel like, and I see on a large scale, a number of individuals who will use this, they've got to justify this radical deviation from the norm. Much of it has been used with this historical text and allegory and, and archaeological findings and understanding as the justification for this radical deviation from society. So we can prove that we have the right to do it. Instead of saying, this path has provided me positive purpose, guidance, and direction as evidenced by the success of my life. So we find ourselves very much at a crossroads. How do we encourage people to stand up and take a look at it. Well, the first thing we do is we get, we take a good long look at the poetic and the prosetta as we've been doing here. But when we look at it with the understanding of the process that was used by the church to conquer other countries, certain things begin to appear, certain inconsistencies with regards to the development of the divine um, and how they were 
used in, in a society. One of the most glaring defects is that of the goddess hell. If you look at Snorri Sturluson when he wrote the Poetic and the Prose Edda, when he put it down on paper, he was the presiding judge of the all thing in Iceland. You don't get to that position unless you have a, a solid understanding of the cultural and accepted legal systems and the divine practices which governed that idea. And they were very much divine practice as we see in the use of Balder and Forseti as gods of justice where none may gainsay their judgments, the houses that had fewest baleful runes, and the ones that offered the best settlements and arguments. You look at the Ace and Yuri, you have the very goddesses that hearken to hear oaths that stand at the door and protect against all intruders that may defend or refute those charges she seems as unjust. Within the very structure of the divine assemblage, you have cornerstones of a free society, that being the legal system. Snorri Sturluson was a master of that. He drifted away and went over to Bishop Olaf in Sweden, and when he came back, he pinned all this and it came down, and people say that the lore is too heavily Christianized. Yet I, I don't think that they know where it's heavily Christianized. I see the reference to a great God returning, one that rules over all. There is one line at the end of the lore that says that something uh, there's something greater, some greater rulers coming in the future, blah, blah, blah. In my mind, that is simply the continuation of the cyclical nature of the spirituality that all of these pagan faiths had. That being the return of Baldur to live in Hrolk's battle hall, all ills will be, will be, uh, will be remediated fields will bear ripened fruit without needing to be sown and they gods will once again play games at golden tables. <laughs> but as it says here, in essence, this is about an intersection of history with super history, whose result is myth, which thus contains something from both worlds, the historical and the transcendental, and thus makes a higher claim to truth. Maxim Emperor Julian the Apostate that which never happened is eternally true has been echoed in the title of a lecture given by Gilbert Durand at a supposing mythology. The myth is nothing but the reflection of a higher truth which directs human thought in a perceptible course. And many of us have this understanding in our hearts that these ideas that we read, that we cling to, that we want to believe in, they speak to our hearts. They offer us some imperceptible truth that moves us forward that has a solution but for the life of them using just the academic understanding that so many people value it is not providing that kind of guidance which people are in desperate need of even if we leave transcendence aside myths higher claim to truth as asserted by robert johnson a jungian analyst he seems to develop gradually as certain motifs emerge. Now those motifs emerge with the development of that mythology and they also emerge with the destruction of that mythology. And this was kind of the foundation of the book that I wrote called Hail the Sun Facing Goddess. Several years ago I spoke with a woman who said that her name was Valerie. She said that you know hell is not the split in half blue and flesh-colored goddess as we see outlined by Snorri, Stur Snorri Sturluson. She was the sun-facing goddess that stood at the entrance of the burial mound that welcomed people into the next realm. <laughs> it was the front half of her that was lovely and beautiful and uh, she was a beautiful lovely sun-facing goddess. It was the back half of her that was the dark mysterious worms and bugs and the shadows and the darkness of the tomb and people got that confused. So how she is described in the lore is difficult to understand, but it's entirely in line with what a Christian people would need to think. For it was, it was the promise of Jesus that there would be everlasting life. The first thing you would need to do in making this conversion is to vilify death and make it a scary place. 
And that's kind of what we see. Now you have to wonder, was this, was this presentation by Snorri Sturluson, was it a warning of what it would be like if we adopted those ideas of monotheism that encourage us to wait on something out there to take care of what's going on in here or wait for someone else to handle the uh, very basics of our life? Probably so. It's, it's not a stretch of the imagination to perceive that idea. The discussion that I had with a young man during a winter night celebration was, was one that was centered around all roads lead to Rome. All of that stuff that I just told you, we are all traveling towards that doorway, that one location, all roads lead to Rome. We are all walking towards one doorway, that being the final doorway, the doorway of death where we will have to <laughs> embrace, if you will, whatever happens to be standing in that doorway. Can we do that with a purely scientific and rational approach? I don't think so. Can we do that with the understanding that we currently have with regards to the poetic and the prosetta? I don't know. It's going to be up to every individual, but when you see the predominant thought process that I'm going to go to Valhalla because I fought with cancer, or I'm going to go to Valhalla because I was in a tussle in the middle of the street, there's a misconception involved in that that doesn't give, for one, Valhalla justice, and leads us to believing that there is some kind of heaven waiting for us if we die in battle that the straw death, that the death of old age, old age and sickness might be one that's vilified. That's not bad. That's not what you're supposed to do. And yet that was the predominant manner of death for everyone in the Middle Ages. Um, dying in battle to get someone to go fight a foreign war, to leave his family behind, and the fact that he might not return, you're going to need a very special kind of carrot on a stick to get them to walk away and risk all of that. A lot of times it was simple treasure, but the Valhalla, the Valkyries, that was the, that was the burial mound of the mass grave. That was all the bodies that died on the battle pushed into one mound and buried, not sorted out. They didn't bring them back. There was no, there was no, no man left behind. You couldn't carry a dead body for six months at sea. It simply wasn't possible. Everybody went into one big hole and uh, rites were performed, burials were happened, and then the Valkyries escorted the dead to a very special place for champions. So when I wrote Hell, the Sun Facing Goddess, it is an attempt to rectify the two situations that you see there, and perhaps one or two more. See, the combination of three somewhere in between and outside of it all, there lies the truth of the matter. And those gray areas of change, those areas where we have been taught to fear the chaos held at bay by the constructs of our mind. And the chaos of this world is very much held at bay by the constructs of our mind, how we think, what we think about. It will appear in this book in particular where you least expect it. And it will shake the foundations of the world the moment it is understood. It's a fairly bold comment for somebody like me to make, isn't it? Look at the goddess hell. If you look at our ancestors, I cannot find where our ancestors in the spirit. So, though a straw death was spoken of as a sad one, those folks were also welcomed into the halls of their ancestors, which was a far more common occurrence than a glorious death on a distant battlefield. To be welcomed into the halls of your ancestors it says that Baldur sits on the high seat in hell. When Hermod shows up to entreat hell to release him so he might come back to the world. The question is, can we make this happen? Will it benefit the faith of Osatru to change this perception of the goddess? Will this collection of words make sense? Will they offer a glimpse into the divine, which is of sufficient magnitude that it will alter our perception in a healthy way so we might embrace this ancient mythology and make it a more fully well-rounded idea for us to live our lives. And it kind of centers around Loki. For someone we most often avoid and consider a child of Loki, 
She certainly plays an integral part in all of this. Life and death, change moving on, the darkness and the unknown. It's the sun-facing goddess that helps us understand all of it. Let's get into the meat of the subject here with regards to where this comes from. The real question that got me to thinking about all of this. How did Odin get off of the tree where he sacrificed himself to himself? When he hung there for nine days and nine nights at the literal edge of death. And in that moment between worlds that, that, that uh, life after death experience, What was it which kept him in this one? What cut him down from hanging off that tree? And we might venture a guess that it was the goddess of death herself that cut him down. See, if you're gonna create some great scenario where you feel it might be okay to send your son on your horse that can transcend the realms into this goddess of death's realm and ask for your son back, is it because you're familiar with that path? In the instant of Odin deaths, when the Norns emerged from the roots of Yggdrasil to govern the lives of men, Hel reached up and set him free. How is it that Odin is so familiar with Helheim that he knows the way to reach the vulva of the Veluspa? A long dead series of the past. He seems to know enough of it to offer instruction and the appropriate steed to make the journey. Great spider-like stallion more than suited to traverse the web of weird between the worlds, eight legs and all. Odin knows the way. Is that what we is that what he told Balder upon his pyre? Why does Hell set such a high standard with regards to returning Balder to the world? Is it because she has done it before? Does she know the consequences of having not one, but two powerful deities which have ha passed back and forth between her realm and the eight other worlds? Would it tip the scales, so to speak, in favor of the current system of Asgardian power remaining in place? Would that remove from our lives the lessons we need to learn to move forward and become better individuals? Both of these beings or judges in their own right. One is the king of Asgard and the god of many other things. The other, Balder, is a perverted judge of disputes who had a firm grip on fairness and justice. Does she set the standard to determine if the world understands what it is that they have lost? If you're converting to Christianity, are you understanding what it is you're giving up? In true form, it is the mind of the immature man who has both stolen the light from the world and also prevented its return. Man does not know what he has lost. In the disguise of a woman, he refuses to shed any tears for the loss of justice and light in the world. This is, of course, Loki disguised as a woman in Balder. Well, he learns to develop into an even greater being as he learns to face the challenges of life far removed from the growing pains of the worlds. There is not much difference between Balder and Nana in their journey through Helheim and Njord. Frey and Freya in their journey through Asgard. All are captives of a sort. All have integrated into their environment. What is the lesson in this that it is repeated in the lore? Repeated, but not really ever understood. In the exact same manner in which Skadi seeks to claim shield from the Aesir for the death of her father, the feminine making an entreaty to the gods, so too does the young masculine seek to engage the elder feminine for the life of a young god and his wife. These questions and many more, this is the whole purpose of everything we're talking about. And there are answers littered throughout the various texts we consider our Lord. Confusion abounds as Christians struggle to come to grips with what they perceive as an enemy to be conquered, life after death, not realizing that some of the greatest lessons we might ever imagine concerning our own lives lay contained within these stories that concern hell. Today, it has almost become a sort of apocrypha in our Lord one of the big four not to mess around with. Yet we see the greatest of achievements emerge from her world, just as Leif and Leifersir emerge from Yggdrasil, Balder, Nana, and Hodor emerge from her realm. They reside in Hrope's battle hall, all ills are forgiven, new feasts are set in green fields upon golden tables. There is abundance without planting. How exactly would Balder know how to function 
in all of this, much less forgive his brother if his journey were not a truly fantastic one. One where a God earns the ability to become even more godly. How are we to become, embrace the idea of Manaz or Degas or Othala or any of those other of the third Ed of runes if we can't begin to use his journey as an example for our own lives, our own journey, as we are both moving towards a doorway to a different realm. In this regard, hell is reminiscent of the other proto-Indo-European goddesses, beings who are both life and death, terrifying to behold, but much loved by many. For out of the death they represent, it would seem that a new life of abundance is possible. One must remember that Odin, Freya, Ran, and Gefjan also rule over certain aspects of the dead. Warriors who die in battle, sailors who drown at sea, and ladies who die as virgin are all claimed for special places by these gods and goddesses. But on the whole, hell handles the details of everyone else. There are striking resemblances among the various goddesses who represent death. Kali is by far the most prominent, still in use. She is a goddess of death, time, and their version of doomsday. Though she is represented in art as a truly terrifying presence, a warrior figure with a necklace of heads, a knife dripping in blood, her tongue sticking out, and a skirt of severed arms. Her role in governing time is that she will eventually consume everything. All roads lead to Rome. And there in the doorway is a mother figure who is irresistible to man and gods alike. There is the possibility that the combination of blue skin and the loveliness of a mother are more accurately combined in hell. A beautiful figure everyone will eventually get to meet. As Valerie Wright in her research has suggested, a being who is not split side to side, but front to back. The front part of her being the beautiful goddess facing the sun at the entrance to the burial mound, the threshold of the afterlife, while the backside of her is the dark, mysterious things of the night and the earth. A goddess who welcomes the energy of life back into the yawning void of Ganungaga. In Malta, there is a temple, a temp and in that temple underneath it, there is a huge labyrinth, and they have found the estimates range from three to 6,000 to as many as 30,000 fragments of bones and individuals, and it's a deep layer of all of these jumbled bones of masses, and the walls are painted an ochre red, and in that, there was a goddess figure, a reclining mother goddess figure. Most of us are familiar with the various Venus figurines found all over Pleistocene Europe, the very full rounded buttocks and hips and full breasts, symbols of a earthly mother. There's a reclining one found in this ancient tomb, reclining. This mother goddess welcoming the dead back into this great chamber painted in ochre red or the rebirth. In Mesopotamia, she was Irshkegal, the queen of the great earth. In the same manner that Hades and Hell assumed the name of the realms they ruled or gave their names to the realms they ruled, something which Davidson dismisses out of hand because she felt that the personification of death had appealed to poets. Her sister is Ishtar, her each sister ruling an aspect of the world and the changing of the seasons. In Egypt, she was Nephthys. Her name means Lady of the Temple or Enclosure. She is the goddess of death, service, lamentation, and rivers, that flowing of the energy of life. In Egypt, the River Nile controlled almost all aspects of life in the Great Desert. Annual floods brought fertilizing silt for healthy crops, fish, and other fresh water. It literally was and is a lifeline for the existence of all manner of fauna thriving upon its banks. A riparian paradise which still ignites our imagination with its awe-inspiring temples, tombs, and mummies. Persephone and Prosperina, the agricultural goddesses of Greece and Rome, are also central ruling figures in the underworld. Their agrarian nature standing in stark contrast to their roles in the underworld, concepts of life and death residing within each goddess. Rome and the Etruscans mark an interesting development in the understanding of the goddess of death from the south and the north. Mania is a goddess whose name in both Greek and the Latin, mania derived from the Pi men, to think. Cognates include antsy, Greek the min minios, life or vigor, and the Avestine manu, the spirit. 
the basis of the words offer a description of man. Man has as a foundational concept to his very right to exist an emphasis on our ability to think. I think, therefore, I am, as Descartes said. Very similar to the gifts bestowed upon men by Odin, Billy, and Vey. Good sense and purpose, a goodly hue and soul, life and vigor, to think and spirit. With this comes the very real fear that the perceived loss of them results in death. The continued existence of our spirit, the thoughts we think, and the energy which animates our body seems from the beginning to be the responsibility of a female deity. And there are many others all over the world. In Rome and Etruscan mythology, Mania or Mania is the goddess of spirits and chaos. In Greek mythology, she is also the goddess of insanity and madness. This is an interesting point. It is the flip side of a right existence as outlined in the previous paragraph. The words which are used to describe her represent the right to exist as well as what happens if we fail to handle that responsibility. <laughs> of course, it may also be a reference to what happens when a man loses his head and his heart over a woman. Through love or syphilis, women can be a very dangerous thing for a man, granting him the amazing inspiration of love or the insanity caused by syphilis, which was not an uncommon thing. We have the Polish Marzana, the Lithuanian More or Morana, in Czech, Slovene, Serbian, and Croatian, or the Slovak and Russian Moranu, or also as Mara, throughout Belarus and the Ukraine, Marzanu, Moranu, Mora, Marmara, the Baltic and Slavic goddess associated with seasonal rites based on the idea of death and rebirth of nature. She is an ancient goddess associated with winter's death, rebirth, and dreams. And dreams are often portents of the future, a realm most often governed by time. Something everyone wants to know about, but a morbid curiosity concerning the future, which more accurately encapsulates how the mind feeds the body chemicals in a time to perceive stressors than anything else. But here's the meat of the issue. Morana, the name of the goddess of death in Thai culture, most closely associated with the Germanic, literally means death. Hell's name does not. The etymology of hell runs the gamut across all of these ideas that I just mentioned. The Old Norse feminine proper noun hell is identical to the name of the location over which you rule, Old Norse hell. The word has cognates in all branches of the, of the Germanic languages, including Old English hell, and thus the modern hell, Old Frisian Hela, Old Saxon Helia, Old High German Hella and Gothic Halia. All forms ultimately derive from the reconstructed Proto-Germanic feminine noun Zalio or Halio, concealed place, the underworld. In turn, the Proto-Germanic form derives from the come on now. From the O grade form of the Proto-Indo-European root kel or coal to cover, conceal, or save. The term is etymology et, etymology etymologically related to modern English hall, and therefore also Valhalla, and uh, in the afterlife, hall of the slain in Norse mythology. Hall and its numerous German cognates derived from the Proto-Germanic halio, covered place hall from the Proto-Indo-European coal. Some individuals theorize that these cognates also form the root words for whole and holy, as we use them today. Just like her presence over the afterlife, her very name holds an influence over the very language we speak. Not just one branch of it, but all of them. Related early Germanic terms and concepts include Proto-German Zalia Runo, a feminine compound, and Zalia Quitian, a neutral compound noun. This form is reconstructed from the Lat Latinized Gothic plural noun Haliorune. Attested by Jordanes, according to philolo philologist Vladimir Oriel, meaning witches. Old English Helia Runa, sorceress or necromancer, according to Oriel, and Old High German Helia Runa, magic. The compound is composed of two elements, Halia, whole, holy, and rune, runo, the Proto Germanic precursor to modern English rune. The second element in Gothic. Halia rune may, however, instead be an agent noun from the verb rhinen, to run or go, which would make its literal meaning one who travels to the nether worlds. 
So the word itself is necessary to describe through the ages in these languages individuals who are capable of working with the runes and indeed traveling to the netherworld. Sound like anyone we know? Odin springs first to mind. And there is a combined skill which is most uniquely attributed to Odin himself, yet it is hell, whose name is necessary to describe the activities amongst the various tribes of mankind. There is a relationship here which has never been explored in a positive light that I know of. The Christian church, on the other hand, has gone out of its way to vilify such concepts, and in these have in some ways bled over into our faith today. Jacob Graham points out in his book, Teutonic Mythology, of course, there are Bible texts that would in the first instance suggest much of this about the insatiableness of hell. Proverbs 27, 20, 30, 16. Her being uncovered, Job 26 and 6. Her, her opening of her mouth, Isaiah 5, 14. But we are to bear in mind that all of these have a masculine or in furnace with which the idea of the Latin orchid also agrees and to observe how the German language, true to its idiosyncrasy, was obliged to make use of a feminine word. The images of a door, abyss, wide gaping th throat, strength and invincibility appear so natural and necessary to the notion of a netherworld that they will keep recurring in a similar way among different nations. The essential thing is the image of a greedy, unrestoring female deity. This is where the Christianization of our Lord takes place. Not with the idea of Loki as the devil, but with the common misconception, which is a common misconception, but with the terrifying new view of the afterlife, one which is in direct opposition to all other concepts, death, and the goddesses who represent it amongst the Pi religions and indeed most other pagan cultures. Grimm continues and makes a fine point concerning this very argument. But the higher we are allowed to penetrate into our antiquities, the less hellish and more godlike may Halya appear. Of this, we have a particularly strong guarantee in her affinity to the Indian Bhavani, who travels about and bathes like Nerthus and Holda, in, but is likewise called Kali or Mahad, Mahadli, the great Elak goddess. In the underworld, she is supposed to sit in judgment on souls. This offers the similar name in the black view, Kailan, nigger, or Caligo make her exceedingly like Allah and Talia is one of the oldest and commonest conceptions of our heathenism. So it would seem that the further we drift away from the monotheistic teachings of the day we choose, the closer we come to realizing the importance of this tradition, of this deity. As we continue with her name, we find even more important parallels, which simply could not be overwritten. The Yala Whiten or Hala Whiten is reconstructed from the Old Norse Helvita, Hell, Old English Helvita, Hell Torment, Old Saxon Heliwita, and the Middle High German feminine noun Heliwites. The compound is a compound of Yalo and Whiten, the Whitens, and from form such an Old English wit, right mind or wits, Old Saxon Gewit, understanding, and Gothic unwitty foolishness, or understanding. These are staggering implications if one but muses upon them for an instance. The words may also be used to describe both sides of the coin of a human thinking process, one of understanding and one of madness, similar to the entrusting goddess Mania and several others. Both states of mind are also powerfully associated with and demonstrated by Odin. His escapades to secure knowledge through drink are well known. The sacrifice of an eye, the affair with Gunlaud, and then there are the question and answer competitions he is famous for encouraging to question and to answer well. Well, there could be no clear indication that people need to develop understanding. The flip side of that coin is, is through the madness of pain and sacrifice, Odin has offered a glimpse into the netherworld. In that brief vision, he was granted the chance to hear the songs of his ancestors, obviously deceased, and an understanding of the runes. And through it all, there was a partner, a being who handled the flows of negative or different energies Odin did not utilize in shaping the nine realms in the universe. The complementing, competing opposite, a divine representation of the theory of special relativity. What if an understanding of the afterlife 
was a commonplace tool used to guide men and women into becoming the powerful beings they became. Kings, queens, and emperors, great leaders of war bands and battlefield heroes, powerful matriarchs whose children shaped the community and the future because of her influence. With the power of will strong enough to become legends in their own time. What happens to a world when you create a being who no longer needs or values this interaction between the living and our ancestors and the knowledge they contain? You end up with an out of balance understanding of what our journey might really be all about. When one God proclaims victory over death and life everlasting, where does the impetus originate for one to become anything other than a wide-eyed onlooker operating as a passerby in this journey of life? If we approach this troubling concept of death from such a viewpoint, it begins to make much sense, the association with Loki, because the uninspired human intellect will always be terrified of the actor. His thoughts are shallow and ruled by fear. It is in this gray area between life and death for the average farmer where we find the trappings of monotheism that creates confusion in our faith even today. Excuse me. The insidious and deceitful trappings draped about the goddess of death by Christian monks are the exact point where its influence created the most damage to a faith and a people. A veritable slice to the Achilles heel of our multifaceted view of the soul complex and the afterlife for the regular person. Warriors, virgins, and sailors all had their own afterlife, which is why it's still strong. But, but a queen which might rule over the halls of our ancestors simply had to go. One who might be as venerated in fear, loved and worshipped as much as Kali. This simply would not do for a new faith. So the idea of a victory over death along with the terrifying image of her realm was created but they forgot about Baldur and left a trail of breadcrumbs for us to find that light of our ancient faith. The confusion of the status of hell in the world of our ancestors because of monotheism began the cultivation of a spiritually literate culture. One of the things which I have never been able to rectify is why would Odin give a child of Loki dominion over death which governed all the nine realms? seems to be more of a wedding gift than a punishment. Much like Gethian and King Gilfi. Remember that little incident served as the impetus for the entirety of the prose edit, the king's journey with the divine. This is quite a position given the importance of the other halls of the dead, two of which are possessed by Odin, Valhalla and Bingo. One, that is got, one is that great hall of Freya, that being Folkbringer, and like I have said, Rand has one as well as Gephi. As I have mentioned, there were notable exceptions to the status quo, and they all have one thing in common. The beings destined for heavens are separated from their society in some way, either physically or held up to some standard which resulted in a sense of being separate in some way. They could be perceived as being better than others or victims depending upon your thought process. It is in a much similar way, though, entirely opposite that the uninitiated human intellect will fear that great destination of the afterlife and vilify her. But hell, well, she gets everyone else. This includes Balder and them. That is a great tale indeed, one we will get to. But for now, let's take a look at what the afterlife might really mean. Are there hints at what the development of men and women of what time might look like? I believe so. As usual, it begins with a king, typically characterized by a lack of understanding about life one who typically operates in a fashion based entirely upon the impulses of his ego. Loki is that immature individual who just never quite makes the grade. His general position amongst the Aesir has usually been one of a being who is more troubled than he is worth. While Balder, on the other hand, is this example of the best and brightest of any of them, or us. In some respects, they are the They are the examples of the two types of individuals who encounter hell and take up residence in her domain. Their actions, if they are emulated by any man or woman, will determine which persona of hell you might encounter. Loki is associated with her because of fear. She is the daughter, the offspring, of the, or the harvest of the actions of the uninspired human intellect. The state of mind most particularly supported when there are no consequences to one's actions, forgiveness and all of that. 
deathbed confessions of the un unsure and acceptance of a foreign god at the last minute. They have done nothing to deserve an afterlife worthy of joining their ancestors in their great halls. This is what the actions of the uninspired human intellect might expect. Balder interacts with hell as something akin to a, a stepmother because he is much further down the line with regards to personal development. The warm and welcoming face on the goddess, in, in the, this aspect of her being, she is more closely in line with almost all the other goddesses of the pagan traditions I've just mentioned. Likewise, men that have failed to develop in any meaningful way will also fear her. The primary mission of the various Christian priests was to spread doubt, to sow uncertainty, and to enrich kings. And it worked. Because somewhere in their convictions, there is always a hint of fear, a seed they sow with unerring certainty. The bravest thing I've seen in a long time was when my grandfather died. I'll, I'll relate this story because it's in the book. He had been a lifelong atheist, and he once told me that if there was anything worth worshiping in the world, it would be the sun, because it powers everything on this little planet. On his deathbed, a few days before he passed, he was asked if he wanted to talk to a minister to make his final confessions. He simply replied, no, I'm not going to change my mind now. Christian, I, and I thought that was a very brave thing for an individual fixing to cross through a door. He has no idea what the other side looks like. Something's there and know what, but I'm not going to change what I've believed all my life now. I couldn't be more prouder when you never told me that story. Tom, if you would mute your microphone real quick, that would be that would be real helpful. Christian ideas create an absence of the concept of right and wrong because there's always forgiveness. You could be the worst human being alive all your life, and yet when it comes time to die, they say it can all be erased. But even a dog knows when he has done wrong. Confront him about pooping on the carpet, and he will leave the room with his tail between his legs. I spelled that wrong. <clears throat> Are we to believe that the conditioning men undergo on this world, which allows them to do great and evil things, results in absent-minded wrongdoings? Are we to believe that they don't know that they are doing wrong? Men fear what they don't understand, but once they begin to take control of their own thoughts to change the paradigms which govern their life, this fear fades. Glad men, on the other hand, and princes as well, go merrily along until the day of their death. No regrets there to hinder the magic of this transition from one state of being to another. And let's examine just a small portion of the Lord to get a clear picture of her, the one used to convince people to change their faith. Here's what it says. Hell he cast in Niflheim and gave to her power over nine rooms to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her, that is, men dead of sickness or of old age. She had great possessions there. Her walls were exceeding high and her grates great. Her hall is called sleet cold. Her dish hunger, famine is her knife, idle her thrall, slav and her maid servant pit of stumbling her threshold, by which one entered, the disease her bed, gleaming bale her bed hanging, she is half blue, black, and half flesh color, by which she is easily recognized, and very lowering and fierce, how terrifying, an afterlife of cold and stumbling, slovenly, rife with disease, all presented by a very fierce and powerful being. This tale presents the attempt to change what people have believed for thousands of years, about what happens to you when regular men die. Why, it is almost a rescue made in heaven. You see, when the conquistadors spread disease, war, and religion in the new world, the key selling point for the missionaries was that there would be no more need to sacrifice your sons and daughters to gods who have allowed this to happen to your people. You would be assured a fine place in a beautiful heaven no matter how you live, so long as you accepted their Jesus. Well, shoot, yeah, people are going to jump on that. But it was bastard. You know who they kept? Above all other gods and goddesses, they kept the goddess of death. And they celebrate her and their ancestors every year on the Mexican Day of the Dead celebration. Those sugar skulls you see decorating fashionable items, they are in some ways a representation of her. And the exact thing, same thing happened to us. In our case, the exceptional ideas of a heaven for warriors could not be erased. While Hala, Bingo, Folkbanger, still inspire soldiers even on the battlefields of today. Why, would you want to steal the spirit of men in an age of war? You wouldn't. But not everybody was a warrior, were they? Most were farmers raising families. They had children and wives. If they were lucky and strong enough, they got to enjoy grandchildren. And for many hundreds of years, those good folk knew that at some point they would be welcomed in the halls of their ancestors. 
and then Snorri sold out, or did he? That passage concerning the realm of hell must have been a truly horrible thing for the regular man to contemplate. To have lived a good life, been productive, raised strong, healthy, loving children who married well, and this, this torturous, this torturous existence is to be our lot? But what a, what a minute, but wait a minute, today and today only, if you will accept Jesus who has victory over death, we've got a special deal for you, heaven with pearly gates, doesn't matter what you've done in life, doesn't matter if you've been a liar, cheat, seducer of men, wives, a breaker of oath. There's this wonderful way with a foreign God and we can help. What a sales pitch. Like a credit repair, like a credit repair scam for the spirits of men, throw in the point of a spear or the tip of a sword, and it's a sure thing. By the time they had spread to Central America, this type of conversion was old hat. The beautiful, loving, terrible goddess with two sides was presented in just one aspect of her being, and it stuck. Unlike the other mythology of the world who escaped the clutches of Rome, or whose civilizations disappeared before its rise, their civilizations still retained some of those great aspects of a goddess of death. The lovely sun-facing goddess standing at the entrance of the burial mound became the glowering goddess who refused to return the light of the world, Balder. A terrible crime had been committed against a goddess who had been for centuries one of the most important beings in our pantheon. And there is no doubt she was that immutable force we must all reckon with, a venerated place in which she still resides among the Hindus and various other cultures, including the modern-day Slavs. Soon, though, the entire civilization of these tribes of northern Europe were engulfed in a holy war. The goddess who saved Odin from himself was valued no more. But there is a clue. There is a warning in these writings of Snorri, the guy we all want to call a sellout, who at one time was the presiding judge of the all thing. Like many writings of the day, any negative arguments against the church must be camouflaged against the keen and penetrating stare of Rome. The lore is as well. Camouflage, that is, against the biased gaze of the uninitiated and the illiterate. Like all my writings, what I present to you works from the smallest integer to the cosmic. And I have written many times about the tale of Balder and shown how well the adoption of these ancient ideas work at the personal level in the world today. Now let me show you how the tale of Balder and of Loki works on the international scale. Let me show you a work which speaks of the return of Austria to the day. beginning of the story is this, that Balder the Good dreamed great and perilous dreams touching his life, the portent of changing times. When he told these dreams to the Aesir, they took counsel together, and this was their decision, to ask the safety for Balder from all kinds of danger. Preparations are made to safeguard the best and brightest of the tribe using the ideas they were aware of. And Frigg took oaths to this purport, that fire and water should spare Balder, likewise iron and metal of all kinds, stones, earth, trees, sickness, beasts, birds, venom, and serpents. This is the idea. Their faith was intricately woven into the natural world. And all men throughout time have solidified their faith by being a part of the world they live in. Temples are lined up with directions, so on and so forth. It was the first thing any tribe ever did when they settled into a new area. They integrated themselves into the environment. <laughs> that goddess Frigg just took an oath and everything in that environment to protect and safeguard the best and brightest to do their work. And when that was done and made known, then it was the diversion of Baldur's and the Aesir that he should stand up in the thing and all others should some suit at him, some hew at him, some beat him with stones, but whatsoever was done hurt him not at all. And that seemed to all a very worshipful thing. The holy treaty was abused in much the same way as man now abuses the world he lives in. But when Loki Laufison saw this, it pleased him ill that Balder took no hurt. The realization of the Pope that these people were too heavily integrated into their world and their way of life. He went to Fensalir to Frigg and made himself into the likeness of a woman. Then Frigg asked if that woman knew what the Aesir did to the thing. She said that all were shooting at Balder. And moreover, that he took no hurt. Then said Frigg, neither weapons nor trees may hurt Balder. I have taken oaths of all of them. Then the woman asked, have all things taken oaths to spare Balder? 
And Frigg answered, there grows a tree sprout alone westward of our hollow. It's called mistletoe. I thought it too young to ask the oath, and then straightway the woman turned away, but Loki took the mistletoe and pulled it up and went to the thing. This is the idea of Loki as a representation of the Pope. How does the Pope steal away the light of the world? He first gets the women to trust him. Disguised as a lowly, humble servant of God, peaceful and pleasant to converse with, non-threatening for the moment, and then he uses that information to strip away the light of the world, the very embodiment of sound of judgment. He uses the plant, which is itself a parasite upon the oaks and other trees on which it grows. But there is more work to do. Earning the trust of the high-ranking women of the community is one thing. Creating a disaster of such proportion that anyone listens to them is another. The Pope needs another type of individual to complete this pincer movement upon this tribe and indeed the entire region of Germania. It is not force of arms which weakens the army of war. Hoder stood outside the ring of men because he was blind, then spake Loki to him, Why dost thou not shoot at Balder? He answered, Because I see not what Balder is, and for this also that I am weaponless. Then said Loki, Do thou also after the manner of other men, and show Balder honor as the other men do. I will direct thee where he stands. Shoot at him with this wand. Odor took mistletoe and shot at Balder. Being guided by Loki, the shaft flew through Balder and he fell dead to the earth. And that was the greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men. The very message of the Pope and the church appeals to the weak and infirm, those who cannot create great lives for themselves. But if they can accept the one true foreign god, then they too can be a part of the tribe. Young men not born of royalty could join the church and rise in prominence and position with every bit as much respect as the lords and ladies of the land. Kings will seek their counsel, and slowly but surely the need to work at life succumbs to how much you might donate to the church. This tithe determines if you have the church's respect, even if you are on the outs with the king. The second part of the pincher movement is activated. The message takes root in the weakened, the downtrodden, the outcast, and the outlawed of the tribes of the day, whispering into their ear that they are worthy even if they cannot measure up in any meaningful way. Then when Balder was fallen, words failed all the Aesir and their hands likewise to lay hold of him. Each looked at the other, and all were of one mind as to him who had brought the work, but none might take vengeance. So great a sanctuary was in that place. But when the Aesir tried to speak, then it befell first that weeping broke out, so that none might speak to the others with words concerning his grief. Sometimes I wonder if we find ourselves in the same situation, not being aware of the light of the world in which we stand and being unable to express to each other the words that express our grief. But Odin, Odin bore that misfortune by so much the worse, as had most perception of how great harm and loss for the Aesir were in the death of Balder, the loss of the old gods. How could this be happening in this community? Where are those Christians coming from? There seems to be no army to rally against. Yet our civilization is now in peril. Our very way of life is now being determined by someone who no longer has our best interest here in this world at the heart of their decision-making process. But the king knows what's happening. The end of their way of life is at hand. While great warriors weep at the loss of the light of their world, challenges to be met, struggles to be handled, and freedom is all now on the line. It may all be lost as the proving ground for men. As warriors would toss weapons and physical contests against young men to make them into stronger warriors, now it seems that the weak, the meek, are beginning to inherit the earth. It is such an alien concept to the men of this time, they hardly know what to do with it until it is too late. But there is one more avenue the church must seal off, the escape route of every man, woman, and child. Now when the gods had come to themselves, Sprig spake and asked who there might there be among the Aesir who would fain have for his own all her love and faith. Let him ride the road to hell and seek if he may find Balder and all for hell a ransom she will let Balder come home to Asgard. And he is named Hormod the Bold, Odin's son, who undertook that embassy. That slight mirror was taken, Odin's steed, and led forward, and Hermod mounted on that horse and galloped off. Now Odin Frigga must send another of their sons on a mission of man-making to save his brother. Odin knows the way, for he has met her before. 
He knows that she is in possession of the entirety of the knowledge from the ancestors of all the realms. Think about that. Such wisdom might encourage her to see what is at stake. The Aesir took the body of Balder and brought it to the sea. Ringhorny is the name of Balder's ship. It was the greatest of all ships. The gods would have launched it and made Balder's pyre thereupon, but the ship stirred not. Then word was sent to Jotunheim after that giantess who was called Herakin. And when she had come riding a wolf and having a viper for a bridle, then she leaped off the steed, and Odin called to four berserks to stand, pin the steed, but they were not able to hold it until they killed it. Then Herakin went to the prow of the boat and thrust it out on the first push, so that fire burst from the rollers and all land trembled. Thor became angry and clutched his hammer and would straightway have broken her head had not the gods prayed for peace for her. Old enemies know that if the Aesir lose, they all lose. Respect and mighty effort is used to send Balder on his way. Speedily he departs, and perhaps his return will be just as hasty. Then was the body of Balder borne out on shipboard, and when his wife Nanna, the daughter of Neb, saw that, saw that, straightway her heart burst with grief, and she died. She was borne to the pyre, and fire was kindled. Then Thor stood and hollowed the pyre with Mjolnir, and before his feet ran a certain dwarf, which was named Lethal. Thor kicked with him with his foot and thrust him out into the fire and he burned. People of many races visited this burning. First he told of Odin, how Frigg and the Valkyries went with him and his ravens, memory and thought. But Frey drove in his chariot with the boar called Golden Mane, a fearful tusk. And Heimdall rode the horse called Goldstock, and Freya drove her cats. Thither came also much people of the Rime Giants and the Hill Giants. Odin laid on the pyre that gold ring, which is called Draupnir. This quality attended it, that every ninth night they dropped from it eight gold rings of equal weight. Baldur's horses fled to the bale fire with all of his trappings. The old gods, in all their glory, the great races they have warred with, all mourn this loss, this tragedy of defeat, and the forthcoming doom they all face. Now this is to be told concerning Amarta, that he rode nine nights through dark dales and deep, so that he saw not before he was come to the river Yol, and rode across the Yol Bridge, which is fat with glittering gold. Modgudr is the maiden which who called who guards the bridge. She asked him his name and race, saying that the day before they had ridden over the bridge five companies of dead men. But the bridge thunders no less under thee alone, and thou hast not the color of dead men. Why ridest thou hither on hell? Well, he answered, I am appointed to ride to hell to seek out Baldur. Hast thou for chance seen Balder on Hillway? She said that Balder had ridden there over Gil's Grid, but down and north lieth Hillway. Then Hermoner rode on till he came to Hellgate. He dismounted from his steed and made his girths fast and mounted and pricked him with his spurs, and the steed leaped so hard over the gate that he came no wise near it. Then Hermod rode home to the hall and dismounted from his steed and went into the hall and saw sitting there in the high seat Balder, his brother, and Balder tarried there overnight. At morn, Balder prayed hell that Balder might ride home with him and told her how great weeping were among the Aesir. But hell said that in this wise it should be put to the test. Whether Balder were so all beloved as had been said, of all things in the world, quick and dead, weep for him, then he shall go back to the Aesir. But he shall remain with hell if any gainsay it or will not weep. Then her monitor arose, but Balder led him out of the hall and took the ring drought near and sent it to Odin for a remembrance. And Nana sent Frigg a linen smock and yet more gifts, and to Fulla a golden finger ring. Balder sits there in the high seat. There is no wailing of gnashing of teeth on his behalf. He has accomplished great things. His judgment was always fair and equal. No impure thing lasted long in his presence. Why shouldn't he sit in a high place in the afterlife? To show his well-being, he sends back gifts, assurances that he is well and truly on his way to becoming what he needs to become. Perhaps his eyes are opened. He accepts his path and shows generosity even in death. I've spoken many times about those gifts that are sent back. They're symbolic of some really important things. If you have a, a ring that drops it more just like it every ninth night, you have the capability to give armbands to a group of eight warriors every ninth night. Your war party 
your war band, your tribe will continue to grow. It takes a lot of wealth, it takes a lot of power and authority to govern a, a continually growing war band you're going to use to conquer whatever you need to do. Odin sent this with his son that he might conquer whatever's in front of him. But as soon as he gets here, he sends it back. Is he aware of the challenges Odin must face? Is he aware of, or maybe he has become the man and decided, I'm going to take care of this of my own accord. I'm going to build my future with my own hand. Right? He sits in the high seat. And the important thing also is that the complementary competing counteraction to him is Nana. She sends back to, to Frigg a linen smock. When young men ventured forth from their home to go fight in a war, they more often than not wore a homespun garment created by their mothers to protect them from the cold. And as they moved up into the world, as they took a wife, that wife took over those roles and responsibilities. Nana sending this back to Frigg is this reassurance to the mother that he is with me, his wife, I got this, he's gonna be okay. And the full of finger ring she sends. If, if you are an older sister and you get married first and there's still a younger sister in the home, there's a lot of worry and concern on a young girl's part of, will I be a good wife? Do I know how to raise a child? What if it hurts? What blah, blah, blah. For an older sister to send back that finger ring, that little promise that it's gonna be okay as you make this transition into becoming a woman and a wife. What an important symbolic, wonderful thing. But that's not what we're here to discuss. But I, it strikes me as very important in these, these stages of growth that we all have to go through to see this powerful happening. But the change, but change has begun, a separation. Then Hermod rode his way back and came into Asgard and told all those tidings which he had seen and heard. Thereupon the Aesir sent over all the world messengers to pray that Balder be wept out of hell. And all men did this in quick things in the earth and stones and trees and all metals. Even as thou must have seen that these things weep when they come out of frost and into the heat, the return of spring. Then when the messengers went home, having well wrought their errand, they found in a certain cave where a giantess sat. She called herself Thoth. They prayed her to weep Balder out of hell. She answered, Thoth will weep waterless tears for Balder's bale fire. Living or dead, I love not the churl's son. Let hell hold on to that she hath. And men deem that she who was there was Loki Laufis, who hath brought most ill among the Aesir. For all things to weep, they must understand the nature of loss. But the one who desires power above all else knows that he must not allow this return of the very heart of the old gods. So a lie is formed a faithless character who suggests that the death of the gods is a good thing, that hell will weep, will keep what she should. It supposes that these beings were not as much of the part of the earth, earth as they thought they were and begins the vilification of hell. This plants the seed that she might be an evil being. Surely she should know what is at stake. How could she put a people who have known her for centuries in such peril? because she is building him into something better. The timeline of these ancient pagan mythologies was always cyclical. It wasn't linear as most monotheists perceive it. How could one being so effectively separate a people from the world they live in? How could they become so lost? And they began to wonder, what is all of this worth if we are to die and become the tortured denizens of a realm ruled by an unmerciful goddess? The last lie told by the Pope to change the mind of people and conquer them. And the sun-facing goddess hung her head in sorrow. Balder and Nana made her, play, made her a place at their table. Planning for the return of the old gods began. But first, Loki as the literary person, person, personage of the Pope has more damage to do. Why is gold called Sif's hair? Loki Laufison, for mischief's sake, cut off all Sif's hair. But when Thor learned of this, he seized Loki and would have broken every bone in him had he not sworn to get the black elves to make Sif hair of gold so much that it would grow like other hair. Some people call this the rape of Sif by Loki. Most simply refer to it as it is written that Loki cut off her hair. But he offered to replace it with something better. Whatever your perception of the incident is the demonstration of violence however seemingly mild it may be against women. 
And the church would follow that set of instructions like clockwork. Any woman who had an innate understanding, as Sif did, of the harvest and earth, of how things grow, of guarding those herbs and plants which produce household remedies, became a witch. If her head were uncovered or her hair was exposed, she was labeled. Glances would be cast at her and rumors began to swirl. Ultimately, they say millions of women would burn at the stake accused of witchcraft or drowned, stoned, raped, mutilated in some horrific fashion, all instigated by the Pope, and the consequences of which you still see happening in the Muslim world. As the kings and other rulers of the land began to reject this roughshod treatment of the ladies of the land by supposedly well-meaning priests, concessions had to be made. But as with any dealing with the church at that time, it was always like dealing with a liar who had his fingers crossed. Why shouldn't he? He had the will of his one true God on his side. They could have cared less. When low-born men might rise to a rank in society which rivaled nobility without any of the conditioning required of the latter, lesser men began to call the shots. And we see it today with lifelong politicians. The concessions begin as thus. Knowing that the church could not possibly stand up to each and every king against the abuses of local bishops, priests, and missionaries, they made a bargain. Thor, the powerful warlike king, grabbed the very symbol of the church by its scrawny neck. An offer was made to create hair of such golden beauty that it could not be rivaled in other gifts as well. The Pope knew that all he really needed to do was assure these various leaders that their own princesses and queens would not be harmed by the radical efforts to build a church. After that, Loki went to those dwarves who are called Ivaldi's sons, and they made the hair, and Skidbladnir also, and the spear, which became Odin's possession, which was called Gungnir. Then Loki wagered his head with the dwarf called Brocker, that Brocker's brother Sindri could not make three other precious things equal in virtue to these. Now when they came to the smithy, Sindri laid a pigskin on the hearth and bade Brocker blow and did not cease work until he took out the hearth, that which he had laid therein. But when he went out of the smithy while the other dwarf was blowing, straightway a fly settled upon his hand and stung him. Yet he blew on as before until the smith took the work out of the hearth and it was a boar with mane and bristles of gold. Next he laid gold in the hearth and made and made and bade Brocker blow and cease, cease not from his blast until he should return. He went out again, but again the fly came and settled on Brocker's neck and bit him now half again as hard as before. Yet he blew even until the smith took from the ring, took from the hearth of that gold ring which is called a drought mirror. Then Sindri laid iron in the hearth and bade him blow, saying that it would be spoiled if the blast failed. Straightway the fly settled between Brocker's eyes and stung his eyelids. But when the blood fell into his eyes so that he could not see, then he clutched at it with his hand as swiftly as he could while the bellows grew flat and he swept the fly from him. Then the smith came thither and said that it had come near spoiling all that was in the heart. Then he took from the forge a hammer, put all the precious works into his hands of Brocker, his brother, and bade him go with him to Asgard and claim the wager. Even during the creation of these great gifts of war, there was an understanding that they couldn't be, couldn't make them too powerful lest they be turned upon the church. Now when he and Loki brought forward the precious gifts, the Aesir sat down on the seats of judgment. That verdict was to prevail, which Odin, Thor, and Frey should render. render. Then Loki gave Odin the spear Gungnir, and the Thor the hair which Sif was to have, and Skidbladnir to Frey and told the virtues of all these things, that the spear would never stop in its thrust. The hair would grow to the flesh as soon as it came upon Sif's head, and, Skid, and Skidbladnir would have a favoring breeze as soon as the sail was raised in whatsoever direction it might go, but could be folded together like a napkin and be kept in Frey's pouch if he so desired. Then Brocker brought forward his gifts. He gave to Odin the ring, saying that eight rings of the same weight would drop from it every ninth night. To Frey, he gave the boar, saying that it could run through the air and water better than any horse. And it could never become so dark that night or gloom of the murky regions that there should not be sufficient light where he went. Such was the glow of its name and its bristles. Then he gave the hammer to Thor and said that Thor might smite as hard as he desired whatsoever might be before him, and the hammer would not fail. If he threw it at anything, it would never miss and never fly so far as not to return to his hand. And if he desired, he might keep it in his sack. It was so small, but indeed it was a flaw in the hammer that the forehand was somewhat short. 
So much gold and tribute was offered to the gods, these great kings, that their attitude began to soften. Then a mighty ship produced along with magnificent weapons. The security of the kingdoms was at hand. The respect of the ladies of the court had been regained, while the weasels of the church once again found a way to deceive them all. For despite all of these weapons, when the time came, these weapons failed. The church knew that at some point in the future, with money from the tithe constantly pouring in, there would be soon be in a position to have things their way. Constantine and Theodosius saw that. The King of France made it official when he killed the Knights Templar. No organization would be stronger than the church again. The last crusade would be upon the remaining holdouts of Lithuania and their pagan kings. The end of the story offered us that one tidbit of hope we should have listened to. That this violator of all basic trust, the heathen kings of old held sacred, should have had his mouth shut in that very moment. Never again to utter falsehoods in a kingdom of men thoroughly in tune with the world around them and powerful gods in their own hearts. I've gone a little bit over and we'll save it right there and we can continue next week if you'd like. Um, I hope you enjoyed that because I certainly enjoyed reading it. I enjoyed writing it a lot more. Um, some of that is challenging to believe, but I think when you look at the whole of it, there's some sense to be made of that. There's some understanding to be gained from it. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to listen right now and talk a little bit before these bugs eat me alive. <laughs> How many mosquitoes will it take to suck you dry, Brian? Man, they're working on it hard. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. I'll finish it up next week. <laughs> do you have an idea about what you're going to do next week? I'm going to finish the book. Then we'll finish this. I'm going to finish okay. this talk on hell. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. I've already lost my place. Dang it. <laughs> but that's a, uh, that's what, that's what we're looking at. And, uh, and that's such a, uh, such a, uh, There we go. I will save where I left off so I know where to uh, know where to go. Okay, guys, I appreciate your time listening to that. There's a lot to that. It's a heck of a story to tell, isn't it? Yes, it is. But um, I think we'll get to the conclusion of it next week, and I think I. Right, once you read it all, it wraps it all up together real nice. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, you guys. All right. Thanks, guys. See you all later. Thanks. Have a good one.